Cockade of America, presented by DuPont. Just as the stories in tonight's program are about two journeys across the nation, so the whole series of programs in the Cavalcade of America presented by DuPont takes our listeners through the pageant of American progress. Each generation has marked new achievements, including those in the science of chemistry. As you sit at your radio tonight amidst the comforts of modern life, think for a moment of the work of chemists who have made many of those comforts possible. The ideal of the research chemist is well expressed in the phrase which has come to be known as the DuPont Chemist Pledge. Better things for better living through chemistry. As an overture, Don Voorhees and the Cavalcade Orchestra bring us a special setting of the old favorite, Wagon Wheels. Progress of transportation, like all other phases of American endeavor, has been swift and sure. The modern luxury liner, the streamlined train, and the swift transports of the skyways are a far cry from the days of the Yankee clippers, the stagecoach, or the covered wagon trains. And yet, the heyday of these sailing ships and horse-drawn vehicles lies within the memory of living men and women. Among their thinning ranks, there yet remain gallant survivors of frontier days, and we find one in the person of a courageous little haired lady. Her face is marked with 88 years of living, but her sharp little eyes are alive with excitement as she peers out the window of a giant transport 
roaring out of the Omaha airport, westbound on a night flight. The hostess speaks to her. Everything comfortable, Mrs. Dean? Yes, indeedy. <laughs> I'd like being home in my own rocking chair. Only better. <laughs> my rocking chair never takes me anywhere. Well, it's too bad you couldn't wait and take the day plane. You could see the country. Who is better this place? See, tonight, I can imagine it's just like it was in 56. Well, instead of all civilized as it is now. Uh-huh. Oh, excuse me a minute, Mrs. Dean. The pilot's calling me. Tell him not to spare the horsepower on my car. <laughs> I'll do that. Well... How's the little old lady taking it, Betty? Oh, she's grand. Just told me to tell you not to spare the horsepower. <laughs> I'll tell her we're doing 190, but I'll push her up to 220 if she's in a hurry. <laughs> Omaha calling flight 12. Omaha calling flight 12. Go ahead, Omaha. Cheyenne reports sleep. High winds. Visibility 500. Temperature 29. Watch for ice in your wings. Okay, Omaha. Tell Cheyenne to put on the coffee pot. We'll soon be coming in. Well, I hope for Mrs. Dean's sake we don't have to come down this side of Cheyenne. Oh, don't worry about her. She'll stand this trip better than some of those modern girls back there. Yes, she told me that she'd made this trip in 1856 in a covered wagon. It took them three months. Now she's doing it in three hours. Uh Uh-oh, somebody wants a cracker. See you later, Betty. I'll bring you a cup of tea. Hostess. Oh, yes, Kate? I'm hungry. What is there to eat? I have sandwiches. And would you care for tea or bouillon? Sandwiches, tea and bouillon. Well, is that all you have to offer? Oh, I'm sorry. We we don't serve meals on this run. Full of all the stupid things. Now, don't be unreasonable, Diana. You had time to eat in Omaha. I wasn't hungry then, Father. I don't see why we have to put up with so many inconveniences in this day and age. <laughs> if you pardon an old lady butting in things that's none of our business, I'd say you don't know the meaning of inconveniences. I'd like to have had you along on the trip we made out of Omaha in 1856. Uh, do you mean to say you made a trip then? Why, that was in the days of the covered wagon. Canastogas, we called them. Oh. I was eight years old when I crossed with my father, Silas Perry. It must have been terribly hard. There were folks that thought so then, even then. Uh, won't you tell us about it? Oh, sure. It's just an old lady's tale. Oh, well. Please tell us about it. How long did it take? Well, uh, our wagon train was the first out of Omaha after the spring thaw of 56. As well as I recollect, there was 40 wagons in the train to start with, nigh on to 200 men and women folks and a whole parcel of young ones, like a little town moving on wheels. The head south, one night, was leading us across the Indian country to the Rocky Mountains, pulled the men folks together outside the wagons, what had been drawn into a close circle for protection against a surprise attack. Them slinking coyotes sound like banshees are waiting in the night. Mm, like as not, it's a scalp hunt and Sue, which is worse. Now just a minute, men. No go stirring up imaginary danger. There's plenty of real ones. Cherokee Joe has called us all out here. Give you the benefit of his understanding of the ways of this wild country and its savage people. Will you speak to the men, Cherokee Joe? Yeah, Joe, come on. Well, I'm no hand with words, men. I've only this much to say. From this day forward, there'll never be an hour when danger does not wait the train behind every hillock, at every river ford, and in the tall, innocent-looking grass of the prairie itself. Yeah, we'll do as you say, Joe. Aye, aye, but mind ye, there's dangers within the wagon train as well as without. I've contracted to see you safe to the Rockies. Ye have appointed a committee headed by Silas Perry. You'll mind them and me. They're the only law you'll have in a lawless land. And unless you stand together, your bones will bleach on the prairie like many a for you. I saw smoke signals to the north just around sundown, Cherokee. Yes, Mark, I've been expecting them. Do you think the redskins know we're here? <laughs> you couldn't hide a stew pan on the prairie without the engines knowing it was there, Mr. Do you think they'll attack us soon? Most likely outnumber them now, Mr. Perry. But in three, maybe four nights from now, they'll have gathered their braves. Well, what can we do? There's nothing to do but push on. And beginning now, we double the sentries at night. And on the trail, every man that can carry a rifle will ride the flanks. Women folks will drive the team. You can count on every man, woman, and child to do his part. They must. 
Now back to the wagon circle with you, and mind you, keep a close mouth of the dangers ahead. There's no need to be alarming the women folks. That's right. They'll All know right, of it yeah, soon yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on, Joe. Evening to you, my Abigail. Still calling for your cow? Gee, that fifty critter will be the death of me before I reach California. <laughs> Don't go wandering off beyond the picket lines, Miss Abigail. I ain't aiming to. Well, I guess the Indians have themselves a fine milk cow by now. Yes, we're giant up with that buffalo herd we passed today. The land, you'd never think they was a thousand miles from home. Yeah. Join your women folks and mind not a word about what I've said. those nights to the scene around the campfires. We were happy dreaming about our new homes beyond the mountains. My mother joined in the singing, not suspecting the terrible blow that was to strike us the next day. It was near sunset when we reached another ford of the river. Our wagon was near the end of the train. The river was swollen with melted snow and filled with ice. Don't worry when the oxen go into the stream there. They'll swim. Just hold the reins. Yes, Alice. And Margaret, you keep close to your mother. All right, Daddy. Oh, oh. You ready, Mr. Perry? Aye. Keep your oxen headed upstream. The river's deep and swift. We've lost one wagon already. I'm riding my horse and the downside the lead on. I'll force them up the stream. Be careful, Silas. Hold tight to your seat, Margaret. I will, Mother. Be careful, Daddy. Don't worry, my child. Come on, my dear. Here go. Yep. Get up. Come on. Get up. Get up. Look, Mother. The water's too deep, the oxen. Oh, don't worry, dear. They'll swim and then come up so we'll smoke. Silas! Don't keep so close to the oxen. Keep their heads up stream. Silas! I take a hurry. Look out! Look out! My father, but there's no turning back now, even if my mother had wanted to. But there were cheering moments. Folks lent each other a helping hand, and we even had a kind of school. All the kids would gather in one wagon, and there was a Miss Turner who, who taught us. When she wasn't sparking with that young Culver boy from Virginia, I recall one day we was holding a spelling bee. <laughs> to learn to read and spell with your cut off this way. Ephraim Clay, you started this. That Yankee Jones kid stuck me with an arrow. I didn't stick him hard, Miss Turner. An arrow? Where did you get it? My papa found it in the grass yesterday. It's a real engine arrow. Here, look at it. Put it away. And don't you dare stick any of the children again. Yes, my wound. Well, well. Now, where were we? Oh, yes. Uh, Thomas Jones, how do you spell California? California, eh? Uh, C A. Uh, C A L E S. Wrong. Ethan Clay, spell California. I can't. But I can spell Kentucky. Is that where I come from? I can start, Miss Turner. C A L C A L I S S O R O N I A. California. That's very good, Margaret. Ethan, how is your little brother today? He's took him bad with pains, Miss Turner. Pa says he's afraid I won't get well. Ever. Oh, we're all sorry to hear that, Ethan. But I'm sure little Tommy will get well. Oh, oh, oh look, Miss Turner. Here goes Mark Cobra riding down the line of wagons. <laughs> no, never mind, Turner. 
Why they don't take those your lady school moms as a general thing. Hello, Jesse. Why aren't you out gardening us against the Indians? Well, I'm on sentinel duty tonight. I I thought I'd drop by and ask if you'd go for a walk with me tonight when the train comes. Well, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll come over by your wagon. Well, kids, what are you learning? How to spell. Well, here's one for teacher. How do you spell love, Miss Turner? <laughs> Thing. How about giving us a tune on that guitar, you sure thing? Mr. Colbert carries the guitar to scare the Indians with. Oh, do. Let's scare some now. Green grow the lilacs so sparkling with you. <laughs> and the lonely, my darling, stand sparkling with you. <laughs> he means you, Miss Turner. <laughs> and by our next meeting, I hope to prove true. And change the green lilac for the red, white, and blue. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, hey. Yes, there were happy hours, even in that wild land, but never for long. That same night, the alien child of the Clay family passed away, and there was a task to be done that was mighty sad. In the darkness of the moon this night, those who were not on sentry post gathered on the treeless prairie to pay their last respects to the little one. Earth, under the earth returneth. O Heavenly Father, consecrate this ground. In the name of thy own beloved Son. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Ephraim, take your mother back to the wagon. Yes, Father. Uh, thank you. Kindly all. Now, I'd, I'd like to be alone for a few moments. What have you in your hand, Brother Clay? It's only a little cross of wood with his name carved upon it. Well, it'll grieve you, I know, man. But you must not put it by the grave. You, you're not telling me I must leave my son here in this wilderness of grass and sand with nothing to mark his resting place. If you mark it, the Indians will find it. Ye would not want that. No. No, I... I did not think of that. You're right. We must leave no sign. No mark upon this lonely plain. that told of our little band. But life went on just the same. Two children were born before we reached the mountain. And one evening, young Mark Oliver came up to Cherokee Joe's campfire, leading Jesse Turner by the hand. Hi, Cherokee. Hi, Mark. Oh, good evening to you, Miss Turner. Good evening to you, Joe. It's a fine night. Well, it's a fine night to be married. Jesse and I want to get married, Charity. Well, now, glory be. Well, what do you think of that? <laughs> uh, but, hey, wait a minute. You can't. There's no preacher with the wagon train. Yeah, I know, Cherokee, but that don't matter out here. We got a Bible here, and if, if you'll read the service, that'll have to do till we get to a place where we can have it done right and proper. Yeah, sounds mighty irregular. What do you think about it, Jesse? Oh, we love each other, Joe. I don't think it would be wrong. Well, then I reckon... Oh, I know you do it, Cherokee. Now, here's the Bible, and I'll go get some with me. Hey, wait a bit. Well, what is... I, I do this for you gladly, but I can't read. Oh, mercy. Gosh, that's right, you can. No. Let's see, who can we get? Uh, oh, look here. Folks is having a prayer meeting over by Hiram Taggart's. The wagon. Yeah. It takes sitting and proper to keep such a joyous occasion to ourselves. Come on! 
All right, come on, Jesse. We'll get Hiram Taggart to read the ceremony. Yeah. All right. We reckon there ain't no harm breaking up a prayer meeting to perform a marriage ceremony. Well, <laughs> and they're going to be plenty surprised. <laughs> Not as surprised as you think, son. <laughs> <laughs> Our little meeting, Cherokee. Yeah. Now, Thank you. Thank you. Sing Rock of Ages. Yeah, just a minute, folks. Before you do any more singing, these young folks would like a marriage ceremony performed. <laughs> yes, but we have no preacher, Cherokee. Well, Mr. Taggart, you've presided over three christenings, and you've read the good book over graves of your departed ones. I, I have that. Well, I am not what you might call a religious man. But it seems to me that Marion ain't no more sacred than them occasions that mark the beginning and the end of this life. We'd be awful grateful if you'd perform the ceremony, Mr. Taggart. Well, all right, I'll do it. But you'd best have it done over again when you reach California. What two of you stand up with these young people? Uh, since you've no near kin of your own, Miss Turner, I'll give you away if you let me. Oh, thank you, Joe. There's no one I'd rather have. I'll stand as witness. Fine. Oh, now, if you two oh, join oh. your hands, your right hand. Join hands, that's right. Cherokee, right quick! In the moonlight, we saw him. A band of Sioux riding down from the north. What? Sioux? A band of Sioux riding down from the north. We'll keep the women singing, and the Indians will think we're not ready. Start singing, girls! All right. Come on, let's sing. Hurry up now, Mr. Taker. Hurry up. Oh, quick, read the vows. This time. Jesse, do you take Mark Culliver to be thy wedded husband? I do. Mark, do you take Jesse Turner to be thy wedded wife? I do. Hurry and I pronounce you man and wife until death do you part. Good. Quick, Ben, for your kiss. Oh, Jesse. Jesse, honey, I'll be back. wedding ceremony, but it bound those two together for all their lives. Our little wagon train knew all the joys and sorrows of a big town. Birth, death, marriages. What happened when the Indians attacked, Mrs. Dean? Our men beat off the Indians, and after many more weeks of hardships and suffering, our wagon trail rolled over the Great Divide and into California, the land of promise. And to think that within your own lifetime, you're able to span the continent in a single day. Ah, uh, those were the days of real men and women. You know, more than today, I'd have gone across prairies to those two young men that are piloting in this airplane, place, and that young, nice young hostess who waits on us. She's brave. <laughs> I'm afraid I wouldn't have been much help to your covered wagon train, Mrs. Dean. I wouldn't say that, child. Oh, an awful coward. I wouldn't say you were. Here you are, thousands of feet in the clouds. Lying like the wind and taking it as a matter of course. Oh, well, that's different. Oh, is it not so much? It's all what we're used to. Excuse me, please. They're calling me. I wonder if we're nearly there. Don't think so. Oh, but there goes the lights on. Fasten the seat belts. Everybody's belt fastened? What's that for? We're not due for 15 minutes, are we? No, but we're going to make an emergency landing. I see. Let me help fasten your belt, Mrs. Dean. What for? I ain't going to jump out the window. Oh, Please, you must, Mrs. Dean. This is a forced landing. We may hit something. Yes, you buckle it this way. My goodness and gracious, for a girl that thinks she's scared, you're acting cool as a cucumber. But I'm not. I'm scared still. Don't worry, Mrs. Dean. Everything's all right. I ain't worrying. Give me a hand, Mrs. Dean. I figured you'd be three all right. If you end time came, miss. There's the ground. Mrs. Dean, are you all right? Of course I am. Oh, thank goodness. Well, we won't be here long. We've radioed ahead, and the boys from the airport are sending cars right now. My, my, that radio's simply amazing. You're amazing, Mrs. Dean. I never saw anyone so calm. Land sake, Charles. You'd have been right to home in those covered wagon days yourself. <laughs> There's a world of wisdom in the words of the gallant old lady. She knew the rugged courage of covered wagon days, yet recognized in her pilots and fellow passengers that self-same courage. The people of America have blazed a trail from the past to present, a trail that leads onward into the future. The Cavalcade of America.
tremendous strides made by transportation in recent years almost literally have made the nation a neighborhood with the typical characteristics of each section familiar to nearly everyone. For example, we associate Pittsburgh with steel, Detroit with automobiles, Schenectady with electricity, and Wilmington, Delaware with a chemical industry. Yet, curiously enough, though the DuPont Company has had its headquarters in Wilmington for 134 years and still maintains its main offices and principal research laboratories in that city, DuPont has no chemical manufacturing plants at all in Wilmington and only two in Delaware. Chemistry has moved forward with complete disregard of geographical lines. Seven DuPont plants dot New England, where America's chemical industry began. But as the nation pushed, uh, pushed west and south, chemistry marched with it. In all, DuPont maintains 76 factories located in every part of the country, producing chemical products to aid in the manufacture of steel, the mining of coal, the weaving of textiles, the fabrication of rubber, the refining of oil, and an almost endless list of other useful activities. Thus, the DuPont Company's chemical production is as national as the language. Also, it is as local as the city hall or the butcher and baker. In these many communities in 25 states, local men and women make possible the operation of the DuPont plants. They create trade at local stores. They buy local materials. They pay local taxes. It is a wonderful tribute to American ingenuity and American opportunity that from the test tube of the chemist, there has arisen an industry which employs more than a quarter of a million people and which through its purchases of raw materials and its services to more than a hundred other industries gives work or income to hundreds of thousands of others. DuPont alone, as a representative chemical manufacturer, furnishes direct employment to 50,000 Americans and distributes its earnings and dividends to an additional 66,000. Speaking of chemistry's service to other industries brings to mind that outstanding example of motor car. This week, the eyes of the nation are on the new models being displayed at the automobile show in New York. The modern car is really chemistry on wheels. For a chemical reaction, the combustion of gasoline provides its power, and chemistry contributes to the manufacture of practically every part. DuPont, for instance, produces chemicals that improve motor fuels and oils, plastics for safety glass and interior appointments, quick-drying durable finishes, chemicals for plating and hardening metals, products that make tires last longer, and many others. Yes, tremendous advances have been made in chemistry. Yet the possibilities have scarcely been touched. America can look forward confidently to a far greater enrichment of its national life as chemical research continues to develop an infinite number of better things for better living through chemistry. The story of Charles Goodyear and his discovery of the process for vulcanizing rubber will be heard next week at this same time when DuPont presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>